native corridors across the U.S. and advocate, and advocate for reducing human persecution, primarily through trophy hunting and other careers killing methods. Haley has been active in wildlife advocate for more than a decade and is highly skilled in environmental and public policy and public engagement. She holds an MS in environmental studies from Antioch University, New England, and a BA in philosophy from the University of California, San Diego. Haley is currently working to obtain a graduate certificate in wildlife management for Oregon State University. Amanda holds an MS in animals and public policy from Tufts University and a BS in neuroscience and behavioral biology with a minor ethics from Emory University. Please welcome Haley and Amanda. And we work to protect native carnivores from the most egregious killing methods like trophy hunting, trapping, and relentless predator control. Today we're going to talk to you about our country's large carnivores, chiefly gray wolves, grizzly bears, and mountain lions, or as we call them here in Oregon, cougars. Many of you might be wondering why large carnivores continue to be persecuted and why more members of the public don't take a stand against the seemingly never-ending attempts by public policymakers and state wildlife agencies to roll back protections for these animals. One major reason for this is the existence of myths about large carnivores. In North America, cultural values and beliefs towards large carnivores have shifted significantly since the mid-1900s toward an, ethics of, an ethic of conservation and animal welfare. Even so, myths continue to exist that perpetuate the unnecessary and ineffective killing of large carnivores to reduce conflicts, and including with humans, pets, and livestock, and for, uh, to boost prey populations. These myths are also used to justify the extensive trophy hunting of large carnivores in the United States. Today we're going to detail the latest research surrounding these myths, including data from the U.S. Department of Agricultural surveys that show how few cattle and sheep are killed by large carnivores, compared to other sources of mortality, as well as the extensive persecution of large carnivores that has resulted. But first, we'd like to give you a quick overview of why protecting these animals is valuable for social, economic, intrinsic, and ecological purposes. Over the last few decades, biologists and social scientists have documented an incredible shift in Americans' values concerning large carnivores. We highly value these animals and are concerned about their welfare. A study co-sponsored by the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies found that more U.S. residents value and appreciate wildlife than ever before and do not want these animals killed with or without cause. For instance, the study found that the vast majority of Americans don't want wolves killed even if they kill livestock. The Humane Society of the United States has contracted with Remington Research Inc. to conduct a number of polls about killing carnivores for pleasure and fun. From Alaska to Florida, and indeed the entire United States, we found that the majority of people dislike trophy hunting. And we define trophy hunting as um, the, the killing of an animal where the primary purpose is to kill it for display, um, either its entire body or body parts, or for bragging rights, but not for subsistence or putting meat on the table. That might be a secondary reason why they kill that animal, but it's not the primary cause. Social biologists have also found that the majority of Americans abhor predator control practice, practices, such as gunning down wolves from helicopters, poisoning coyote pups in their dens, strangling bobcats with neck snares, and littering our western public lands with deadly and dangerous cyanide bombs that can kill any wild animal, pet, or person. Moreover, studies show, and most people believe, that large carnivores coexist well with us. Wildlife watchers and outdoor recreationists are a rapidly growing stakeholder group who provide immense economic contributions to the local communities they visit. Hundreds of people can view or photograph a grizzly bear in the wild, but when one person kills that animal, it deprives everyone else from the ability to see that animal. For instance, trophy hunters and trappers operating just outside Denali National Park in Alaska have killed so many wolves in Denali that visitor, or near Denali that visitors rarely see these animals anymore. 
The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's 2016 Wildlife Recreation Report indicates that wildlife watchers nationwide have increased 20% since 2011, numbering 86 million and spending more than $75 billion. In contrast, all hunters combined have declined by 16%. The biggest decline was actually in big game hunter numbers. Um, they've declined by more than 20% since 2011. However, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service groups all big game into that calculation, including elk, deer, bear, wild turkey, and other large species. So altogether, big game hunters spent around $15 billion in 2016. That's about one fifth of what all wildlife watchers spent. So you can imagine if you're looking at uh, the, the number of large carnivore hunters and the dollars that they've spent, that's minuscule if you remove that, if you remove the other animals from those calculations. <coughs> so protecting large carnivores from intense and unnecessary persecution is hands down more economically beneficial than allowing the ongoing trophy hunting and predator control of them. And I'm sure everyone here would agree that these animals uh, have intrinsic value, that is, they have value in their own right. The idea that wildlife possess intrinsic value is widely supported by the broad public, signifying the need for current wildlife conservation strategies to incorporate intrinsic value as a foundation for action. Additionally, large carnivores like grizzly bears, wolves, and mountain lions hold great ecological value. They're vital for their ecosystems. Their feeding activities actually increase biological diversity. For example, as the image here shows, large carnivores help regulate ungulate populations. When I say ungulate, I mean species like deer and elk. So by doing so, they protect fragile riparian areas, uh, benefiting amphibians, fish, birds, and a variety of other species. Protecting and conserving native carnivores ripples through their communities. The result is greater biodiversity and healthier, sustainable ecosystems. While the majority of U.S. residents can agree that the benefits of large carnivores provide overwhelming evidence that we need to protect them from persecution, we continue to hear from the public a number of persistent myths about these species, typically perpetuated by state and federal wildlife agencies, trophy hunting proponents, and media outlets looking for an eye-catching news hook. The story often told is that wildlife agencies need to employ heavy-handed management of large carnivores to reduce conflicts with humans, pets, and livestock and for prey protection. And because if we don't kill them, their populations will explode. We'll now detail why these myths don't hold up against credible science and how the current intense persecution of large carnivores may actually be making conflicts worse. <laughs> All right, so the first myth um, that we're going to take a look at is this idea that large carnivores pose a significant threat uh, to human and pet safety, when in actuality, large carnivores are rarely posing any threat to human safety and will avoid humans whenever possible. So attacks on humans from large carnivores are extraordinarily rare and typically caused by some kind of provocation. Um, a person is many more times more likely to die from a lightning strike or a vehicle collision uh, with a deer than from a native carnivore. Uh, most encounters between humans and mountain lions go unreported, primarily because people fail to detect that they are in the presence of these animals. Um, because of this, the number of encounters is likely undercounted. Um, and ironically, a new study suggests that mountain lions recolonized the states where they historically occurred um, but are now absent, fewer people would die in vehicle strikes with the virgin deer populations. Moreover, uh, there's no evidence that trophy hunting and predator control of large carnivores makes people safer, and in fact, conflicts with humans may actually be exacerbated um, by this intense persecution because it disrupts the stable social structures of wolves, bears, and mountain lions. Um, for example, Adult mountain lions uh, ward off or even kill younger males who stray into their territories. Um, with preference for the largest trophies, mountain lion hunters end up killing these territorial males, um, leading to an influx of younger males buying for his territory and the females that he shared it with. Um, this influx of young lions usually results in more conflicts with humans and livestock, uh, and greater mortalities to the local network of mountain lions, especially kittens, from the previous sire. So our second myth 
myth is that large carnivores uh, kill vast numbers of livestock. And we see this often as a justification for tricky hunting seasons and under control. Um, in actuality, uh, our research has shown that large carnivores rarely prey on livestock. So in the United States, uh, data show that mountain lions, grizzly bears, and wolves kill a few cattle and sheep. Um, according to the most recent data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, all native carnivores, uh, domestic dogs, and other breeding animals uh, kill less than 1% of U.S. cattle, US cattle inventory and less than 4% of the sheep inventory nationwide. All felids, including mountain lions, bobcats, uh, and lynx killed few, fewer cattle than domestic dogs, taking only 0.02% of U.S. cattle in 2015. Um, in fact, USDA data show that farmers and ranchers actually lose nine times more cattle and sheep to health, weather, burnings, and theft problems than to all native carnivores combined. Uh, furthermore, in states where they live, ranchers lose 23 times more cattle and sheep just for respiratory health issues than they do to wolves. Uh, the Human Society of the United States recently published three reports back in March um, that present our analysis of the USDA's uh, data sets for cattle and sheep deaths um, in Mount Lion, Grizzly Bear, and Wolf Occupied States, uh, excluding Alaska. Um, these are also available online on our website. Uh, we also compared the USDA's numbers to those from other governmental agencies, um, such as the states and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which corroborates our findings that while the USDA's prediction figures are significantly exaggerated, um, they're still not in way compared to livestock mortalities from other causes. So just to bring this a bit closer to home, um, we'll take a look at livestock losses from large carnivores in this region of the country. So in the Northern Rocky Mountains, uh, which includes Oregon, Washington, uh, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming, USDA found that wolves were largely responsible for just over 1% of total unwanted losses in the region. In contrast, maladies like the health, weather, theft, or big problems um, accounted for 87% of such unwanted losses. Um, as I, I briefly just mentioned on the previous slide, we did find the USDA's prediction figures to be pretty significantly exaggerated when compared to data collected from states and the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, in the Northern Rocky Mountains, for example, the USDA claims that wolves killed around 4,300 cattle. Um, well, the US Fish and Wildlife Service verified only 161 such losses. Um, the USDA's methodology involved collecting data from a few mostly unverified sources, which they then extrapolated statewide. Um, that led to discrepancies in the USDA's data, such as reporting livestock losses due to grizzly bears in areas where they aren't even present. Oops, actually, I'm going to go back. Sorry. But it's too soon. Um, so while the mortalities of non-native non cattle and sheep were pretty nominal, uh, the mortalities of the Rocky Mountain wolves were huge. Um, total human caused wolf mortalities for that region in the same year uh, were 694, with the trophy hunters and herd control agents alone killing 91% of them. So the same holds true for cougars. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, and indeed in the majority of cougar-occupied states, uh, these native cats preyed on less than 1% of the state's cattle and sheep inventories. Uh, according to the USDA's 2015 cattle data from Oregon, only 0.05% of cattle were taken by cougars. In Washington, only 0.02% were taken by cougars. Similarly, the USDA's data showed that cougars took only 0.16% of sheep in Oregon and 0.24% in Washington. Um, again, other causes of mortality, like weather, respiratory disease, and digestive health issues, far outnumber cattle and sheep mortalities um, from cougars. Um, even so, myths persist that cougars and other native carnivores um, is necessary to protect livestock. So despite these incredibly low numbers, uh, protection of livestock is still one of the greatest arguments used to justify the killing of carnivores. Yeah, research shows that killing large carnivores to reduce complaints in livestock deprivations can actually have the opposite effect. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, killing large carnivores disrupts their stable social structures 
and leaves open territories for younger animals to colonize. These younger animals are often less skilled at hunting in natural life, right? And more likely to be involved in livestock conflicts. Um, with offshore bee hunting and predator control, especially around areas with livestock, large carnivores are able to create those stable social structures, um, keeping younger animals away. According to a recent Washington study, very heavy hunting or 100% removal of resident adult male mountain lions in one year uh, increased the odds of complaints in livestock losses the following year by 150 to 340%. Additionally, in Michigan, wildlife biologists found um, that lethal removal of wolves for livestock protection reasons on one farm increased future wolf predation on their neighbor's livestock. Um, and in 2018, researchers published an analysis of more than 140 predator control studies and found that removing carnivores generally had little effect on reducing conflicts, and conflicts are actually increased in some areas. Furthermore, numerous published studies that we cite in our best job analysis reports um, found that non-lethal methods to protect cattle and sheep are more effective and less costly than lethal control of large carnivores and other wildlife. Um, a variety of non-lethal methods are available to livestock corners, uh, methods such as predator proof fence pinning, range riders, electric fencing, flagellary, um, sanitary carcass removal, can provide livestock corners. Uh, the tools necessary to protect their livestock will also prevent the unnecessary killing of large carnivores. However, uh, the USDA's data also shows that only a fraction of cattle and sheep growers in the US use these methods to protect their herds. Um, for example, the data show that only about 20% of cattle operations in Oregon and Washington uh, use non to protect their livestock. Um, so working with livestock growers to actually implement effective non lethal methods is really vital uh, for preventing conflicts. Um, so we'll be available after the presentation to discuss our livestock mortality analyses in more detail. Um, and with anyone who's interested in learning more. Okay, I'm going to go into our, the next two myths. Um, the third one is that killing large carnivores is necessary to grow abundant prey herds. In fact, killing large carnivores does not address the true culprits that are typically causing prey declines and may actually harm our ability to tackle the spread of deadly diseases in prey herds. Some wildlife managers accept this premise that reducing large carnivore populations is necessary to increase their prey populations, like deer and elk. Yet studies show that humans are actually the greatest source of mortality to all medium and large sized mammals in North America, and hunting accounts for most human caused mortality. So, in short, the predominant predators of deer and elk are human hunters, not native carnivores. In fact, killing large carnivores can actually often increase ungulate mortality. For example, in two 20 year studies, researchers found that killing wolves let a caribou herd get so large that they stopped reproducing and began to starve. That's commonly known as a practice of reaching their, uh, it's called carrying capacity. Um, in another study, the lethal control of Alaskan wolves led to an increase in coyote numbers and an imbalance in the local ecosystem structure. This phenomenon, sorry to throw so many technical terms at you, but this is a, a, a common practice called, or a phenomenon called a mesopredator release. Um, it's been documented many times. Top carnivores limit the population sizes of smaller carnivores. It's really essential for balanced and healthy ecosystems. Um, when you remove those top carnivores, it causes an imbalance. Um, and so it's really important to maintain those large carnivores to help, uh, to help balance those local ecosystems and the relationships between species. Additional factors also play a significant role in the health and stability of prey herds. Disease, habitat loss and fragmentation, a lack of ad adequate nutrition, weather, and a variety of other significant factors affect their populations in the US. So because these ecosystems are so complex, killing native carnivores to brood boost prey populations is typically ineffective at under, uh, addressing prey declines because it doesn't really get to those true culprits that are limiting prey populations. Killing large carnivores is not only ineffective at boosting prey populations, it can also be quite harmful to them. Large carnivores play a critical role in suppressing the prevalence of, the, of disease in prey species, especially, especially chronic wasting disease, or you may hear it referred to as CWD. 
It's an epidemic plaguing ungulate populations um, like deer across the, the North American states right now. As of June 2019, as you can see from this map, CWD has been reported in at least 24 states in the continental US, as well as two provinces in Canada. Carnivores, uh, uh, carnivore predation limits or even prevents the transmission of CWD and other diseases in prey species by lowering the total number of infected individuals in the prey population. Moreover, research indicates that predators like bulls and mountain lions select prey disproportionately if they appear impaired by malnutrition, age, or disease. So essentially, large carnivores target and help remove sick individuals from prey birds, helping to prevent the spread of disease. Human hunters, on the other hand, tend to target the largest and most fit deer and elk and are thus less helpful to stop the spread of the disease. Furthermore, carnivores help eliminate CWD as an environmental contaminant by scavenging on infected carcasses, preventing disease spread through soils and other means of dispersal. That's a huge way that CWD is spreading is because it's getting into the soil and, and uh, dispersing environmentally. And the fourth myth is that hunting large carnivores is necessary to keep their populations in check. I have this conversation with my father all of the time. People think that we need to manage large carnivores the same way we manage deer, and that's just not accurate. The fact is that these species are self-regulating and protecting them from hunting will not result in population explosion. Large carnivore populations are limited by their num the number of prey. In order to survive, their populations must stay at a smaller size relative to their prey's biomass, or they risk star starvation. When prey populations decline, so too do native carnivore populations. Additionally, large carnivores are limited by their social communities or networks. For wolves, only the alpha breed and the rest of the pack is behaviorally sterile. For bears and mountain lions, they'll kill any young animal attempting to take over their territory. So those, those social structures, those sensitive communities, those relationships are really essential to making sure that we, we are able to, or that an, these animals are able to keep their own population numbers in check. When we start killing them, we disrupt those social structures, and we create the problems that we're seeing. We create those conflicts. Moreover, if a pregnant female bear does not attain sufficient body fat before she enters the den, her body will absorb the embryos before they implant. So if there's a food shortage in any given year, underfed females will not reproduce. Wildlife managers must recognize these population limits on large carnivore species and incorporate them into management strategies, rather than perpetuating the myth that we must kill these animals to control their numbers. Um, so large carnivores face a number of persistent threats, including habitat loss, fragmentation, um, poisoning, disease, and predator control. Um, and we could spend a really long time talking about all of those threats and the cumulative effects of them. Um, but for today, we'd like to touch on a topic that we've brought up throughout the presentation and that is really the result of perpetuating the myths that we've talked about, um, which is trophy hunting. Um, and trophy hunting is one of the most immediate and direct threats that large carnivores face. Um, and the HSUS and many other organizations are dedicated to fighting this threat across the country. So each year, uh, wolves are killed by trophy hunters and tracked uh, throughout the Northern Rocky Mountain states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Um, this number could soon go much higher uh, if the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is successful in their current attempt to remove federal protections for gray wolves under the Endangered Species Act. Um, so as many of you are aware, this past March, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service proposed a rule that would take wolves in the lower 48 states off of the Endangered Species List. Uh, wolves only occupying a fraction of their historic range, uh, and this proposed rule jeopardizes a fragile recovery that is really only just beginning. Um, by the July 15th close of the comment period on that proposed rule, uh, over 1.8 million people had submitted comments uh, opposing the rule, and 86 members of Congress, uh, over 100 scientists, 230 businesses, 367 veterinary professionals, um, and many others all submitted letters in opposition to the proposal. Um, so when wolves are not protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act, they are routinely subjected to state-sanctioned trophy hunting and trapping seasons with quotas that are designed to reduce their populations to arbitrary goals 
They're based on politics, but not the best available science. Um, for instance, after wolves in the Great Lakes region were delisted, nearly 1,500 wolves were killed under reckless trophy hunting and trapping seasons in just three short seasons. Um, in states where wolves have already lost their federal protections, they face relentless persecution. For example, in Wyoming, they consider over 80% the state a predator zone, uh, where trophy hunters and trappers can employ really cool methods um, to capture the wolves with pretty much zero restraint. Uh, we've heard stories of people running in the snowmobiles, pickup trucks, or just really horrible things. Um, starting in 2017, Idaho no longer limits um, the number of wolves killed throughout the state with a quota, statewide quota. Um, it even allows hunters to kill multiple wolves, including in the den in springtime when whole families are vulnerable. Um, so in addition to trophy hunting and trapping, wolves in the northern Rocky Mountains, as well as Oregon, parts of Oregon and Washington and Minnesota, um, are frequently killed in response to conflicts with livestock. Uh, for example, in 2017 in Minnesota, the USDA Wildlife Services um, can, received, confirmed just 89 of the 152 complaints that they received from livestock operators. But despite that low number of verified complaints, uh, wildlife services operators killed 190 wolves that year. So currently Alaska is the only state in the U.S. that allows the trophy hunting of grizzly bears. Um, in the lower 48, grizzly bears are listed as a threatened species in five populations. Uh, the largest the, is the Northern Continental Divide ecosystem. Uh, the second largest is the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Um, we continue to fight persistent attempts to remove protections from grizzly bears. Um, losing their federal status would not only prevent grizzly bears continued and much needed uh, conservation by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, but it would also place ongoing management in the hands of state wildlife agencies that want to open up trophy hunting seasons. Um, in their recent effort to remove federal protections of Yellowstone area grizzly bears, Idaho and Wyoming were both quick to set up trophy hunting seasons. Um, fortunately, a large coalition of groups came together and we won a lawsuit in 2018 uh, ensuring the continued federal protected status for the population. Um, despite the fact that they are listed as threatened, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem population has seen an unprecedented spike in human-caused mortalities uh, since 2015. Um, causes include elk hunters who fail to carry bear spray or um, use lethal control on bears. Uh, despite requests that hunters be mandated to carry bear spray, uh, Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming have failed to make that common sense uh, regulation. Um, similar to like, wearing blaze orange, we believe it should be a common sense uh, safety regulation. Um, causes also include ranchers who have failed to secure their livestock in bear country uh, and legally remove bears. Um, poachers, most of whom go unprosecuted. Uh, and black bear hunters who have accidentally kill grizzly bears, uh, even over bait piles. So the past four years uh, have seen a tragic and record-breaking spike in the numbers of grizzly bears uh, killed in conflicts with humans in the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, in fact, more than 70% of grizzly bear deaths in this region are now caused by human activity, and almost all are preventable. Uh, most of these conflicts happen due to perceived uh, interference with livestock or encounters with elk hunters, uh, who leave behind gun piles and carcasses, which are a very attractive uh, food source for its ears. <laughs> the third species we're talking about today are mountain lions. Each, each year, trophy hunters kill thousands of mountain lions using cruel and unsporting methods, especially the use of uh, radio collar hounds, so GPS collared hounds that go out and, and chase them, as you know. Here in Oregon, um, we continue to fight legislative attempts to repeal um, the ballot initiative that, that banned that. Um, it's, you know, every year we see legis legislators trying to get rid of that ban um, and bring back recreational hound hunting cougars. Um, and it's getting harder and harder, so we could definitely use more help in that fight. Um, we also see st some states um, allow steel jaw leg hold traps and wire snares. Those include um, New Mexico and Texas. However, New Mexico um, just announced that they're proposing to end their recreational trapping of cougars. So that's really exciting. We're in the process of working with advocates and other organizations to spread the message 
can get the word out to support that cause. So if you know anyone in New Mexico, um, please come talk to me so you can definitely use their voice. For over the last 40 years, trophy hunters have killed approximately 80,000 mountain lions in the United States. Humans continue to trophy hunt mountain lions throughout the majority of their current range, excluding California and Florida, as you can see here from the map. Some states stand out as exceptionally egregious. Uh, more mountain lions die in Idaho each year than any other state. Oregon has the highest annual quota at 900 calves, essentially allowing unlimited hunting during the year-round season. In Texas, mountain lions are considered non-game animals, and even newborn kittens can be killed by any legal means. And in Nebraska's Pine Ridge region, the State Wildlife Agency allows a trophy hunting season on a tiny population of about 40 independent aged lions. Predator control is also a major threat. For example, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has created regional target areas amounting to hundreds of acres where cougars are randomly culled for the so-called purposes of conflict reduction and to boost prey populations, mainly so that humans can hunt uh, deer and elk. The agency has spent millions of dollars with little to no results showing their efforts to be effective. Ungulate numbers are not up, but human cougar conflicts are, and that's a direct result of intense trophy hunting and predator control, as well as ongoing development in natural spaces, with little effort made to educate the public on how to coexist with cougars and other wildlife. As a resilient species, killing off large numbers of mountain lions will not have lasting effects for state and wildlife agencies looking to reduce conflicts. Instead, wildlife agencies would benefit from ending trophy hunting and allowing mountain lions to establish stable social structures, uh, um, which will inevitably keep conflicts low. Um, and so, real quick, let this guy pass. Um, we, we'd like to show you a new video that we recently released. This is our first like public showing of the video on um, trophy hunting with mountain lions. And um, we hope you guys enjoy it. All right, let's go see what they got. Trophy hunting is really just, it's any hunting practice where a, a, a trophy, a wildlife trophy, an animal's body part is collected at the culmination of the hunt. Large carnivores, especially those iconic species like gray wolves or grizzly bears, can bring substantial economic benefits to the local areas in, in which those animals reside. One study conducted back in 2007 estimated that wolves alone bring between 24 and $49 million uh, to the greater Yellowstone area in, in terms of economic benefits. So if, if we're removing these animals from these areas around the park where they draw in tourists, then you potentially are losing out on that very reason why people are coming to the park in the first place. For the mother mountain lion, it's a matter of life. It's a matter of survival and subsistence versus for the trophy hunter, it's a matter of pleasure, recreation. The one clearly outweighs the other. My God, we're chopping off animals' body parts and putting them on our walls. And there's just something so disturbed and disturbing about that. These cougars are self-regulatory. Disrupting their social system causes these massive cascade effects. You know, we have immigrants coming in and we have depredations going up. We have uh, human complaints going up, uh, pets are being killed, uh, threatened and endangered game animals like caribou are, are being uh, decimated. And uh, all of this because of over-harvesting. I mean, it's, it's really quite surprising. You know, everyone thought that killing cougars in large numbers would solve all these problems, but it actually caused all the problems. Since 2011, the number of big game hunters including mountain lion hunters, has dropped by more than 20%. While states typically charge a nominal fee to trophy hunt mountain lions, the economic reality is that the majority of conservation funding in the United States comes from sources other than trophy hunting. Mountain lion guides and outfitters charge trophy hunters several thousand dollars per hunt. States retain few of the available revenues for maintaining the conservation of mountain lions for the people. 
animals like cougars and bears and wolves are very different. They haven't evolved to be killed by anything other than themselves, so they're self-regulatory. So any additional mortality simply drives the population down, so it's not conservation. So if you kill predators, you're just adding to the natural mortality rate, causing a population decline. So that can't be conservation. Right? It's not conserving anything. All it is is driving populations down. They're not commodities. They're not toys and trinkets for us to just go and have our way with and put their paw on our table. They have their own interests in living their lives. That's why trophy hunting shouldn't even be on the table. So finally, uh, what groups like the Community Society of the United States um, and the many other uh, wonderful organizations we collaborate with, many of whom are here today. Um, we fight every day to protect and conserve large carnivores, but we really wouldn't be able to do it without the support of public advocates uh, who care just as much about these animals as we do. Um, and while you may have heard this before, uh, your voice is really essential in advancing uh, proactive policies and fighting harmful ones. Um, educating your communities about these issues and reaching out to your legislators um, and commissioners and spreading the word uh, through the media outlets are just some of the direct and uh, really influential ways uh, that you can help contribute to this effort. Uh, and with that, we're happy to take any questions. I think we have a few minutes left. Yeah. Um, presumably, under the Federal Endangered Species Act, the federal agency has responsibility for that animal in the great work in this case is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And they should have had a, uh, a recovery plan developed for that species as part of their responsibility under the Native Species Act. And that recovery plan would set recovery goals that were relatively well vetted by the scientific community. And they would not be delisting that species until those goals have been met. That's the presumption. But you're saying that they're delisting without having met those goals, or these goals were inadequate? I guess I'm not quite clear about exactly what they're not, what, and, or is it coming from the top down from the Trump administration, not even vetted on the scientific fact? Yeah, so the current uh, delisting effort is based on a really outdated plan. Um, and I believe CBD is working on um, a lawsuit. I don't know, Omar, if you want to weigh on that. Sorry, put you on the spot. <laughs> we filed a lawsuit last fall challenging the agency for failure to develop a nationwide recovery plan to species species. Any other questions? Um, along that line, if, if the wolf is protected under the Endangered Species uh, Act right now, why are the wolves being hunted or trapped? Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, the Northern Rocky Mountains population uh, of gray wolves, which is uh, known as a distinct population segment, has been delisted. Um, so they are no longer listed on the Endangered Species Act in those states, as well as um, parts of Washington and Oregon. Um, so the current delisting proposal uh, would really affect wolves in the Great Lakes region, as well as um, any dispersing wolves that move into our previously unoccupied areas. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the statistics with me, but several years ago, an employee of the Idaho Fish and Game Department released a study that was printed in our local newspapers where he showed that more um, deer and elk are killed by poachers than by large carnivores like wolves and cougars. And I thought that was a real eye-opener. So maybe we're going after the wrong groups here. <laughs> yeah, that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, chronic wasting disease spreads from deer and elk to cattle. I heard and read in the past this concern that it was spreading to humans who eat it. Do you have evidence of that? And is 
that part of your campaign? Okay. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so chronic wasting disease, it, it hasn't passed to cattle. It's, um, it's similar to, um, what is the yes. disease called? Mad cow disease. Um, they're not one and the same, but they're very similar diseases. So they're not passing the disease to cattle. What's happening is we're seeing captive herds of like deer and elk with chronic wasting disease. Um, a lot of people don't know this, but there are like captive herds um, will grow deer and elk um, for, for hunting purposes. And so there is um, some, we've documented, we've seen transmission between captive and wild herds. Um, it's kind of what came first, the chicken or the egg. They don't know if it came from captive herds first, or wild herds first, but we believe it originated somewhere in um, northern Colorado. There is some concern about the transmission of chronic wasting disease to humans. There's a lot of research going on right now to look into that further. Uh, they haven't documented that yet, but researchers are looking into it, and I know it, is, it definitely is um, a concern. And so agencies, um, state and federal agencies, are telling um, deer and elk hunters to be extremely cautious when hunting um, deer and elk in, in herds that have chronic wasting disease. Um, or near other herds with chronic wasting disease because they, they are concerned that transmission could possibly happen with humans. <coughs> yeah. So cougar kills have uh, recently been shown to have something like 216 different species of needles around them as opposed to some other because of the one of El Brock's, uh, Mark L. Brock's study uh, for Panthera showed that uh, they called the uh, cougars the McDonald's of the wildlife world because they put down so much meat for, for so many critters. Well, uh, one of my thoughts is that uh, I've read, uh, they think chronic wasting disease is partly like when an animal rules while it's eating and the uh, prions get on leaf, leafy material. And I, I started asking a few researchers whether anyone's looking into are these beetles taking some of this uh, infected meat and pulling it down underground where it's not available and perhaps their digestive systems uh, when they process food might be breaking the prions apart uh, and, and invalidating it could be another reason we need large carnivores. You know, not, not only that they kill the creature, but that they help get the uh, prions out of off the surface where it's available to ungulates who are uh, uh, susceptible to them. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I would love to see research on that. We should talk about getting some agencies and um, some universities to look into that further because I think that, that's pretty fascinating. Yeah. Um, so on your stats, it seemed like coyotes were going after livestock at an almost an order of magnitude higher than any other of the um, or game species we were looking at. Do you have any indication as to why coyotes are that much higher than the rest of them? I would say probably prevalence. Yeah. Um, there's a lot more coyotes on the landscape than there are large carnivores. Um, for example, mountain lions, you know, their densities vary, but mountain lions, you're going to see about two mountain lions per 100 square kilometers. Um, they're extremely rare, as are grizzly bears and wolves, whereas coyotes, bobcats, and other meso carnivores um, are much more prevalent on the landscape. And if we start to recover those bigger ones, do we expect them to have numbers over there? Yeah, I think to an extent, um, generally, that was one of the things that we mentioned earlier is that meso-predator release and wolves and, and other large carnivores have larger territories than those smaller carnivores, um, and so they help kind of keep keep them out of those larger areas, so that's how you get you know, a good balanced ecosystem. Anything else? All right, well, we'll be available at our table. Um, feel free to come back to talk about it and chat with us if you have any answering questions.